Welcome to another episode of The Tech Clinic. And this is the first one Ollie has let me loose on. So I'm going to be answering some of your questions that you've submitted using the hashtag AskGCNTech. So let's get cracking and make a start. So our first question is submitted by Newtona1. And they say, Ollie, obviously Alex today, um, love learning new things, so here's hoping you can help. I have a wheel on turbo trainer with a turbo specific tire. What tire pressure should I run? And does it matter so long as it's always the same bike? Then they've put in that the bike and them weigh 65 kilograms. So first off, I guess I should apologize. It's obviously me, not Ollie today. So uh, yeah, a little bit different for you there. But yeah, it's important that it's a good start that you've got a turbo specific tire. Save your best tires for, uh, you know, out on the road. You don't want to wear them out on the turbo trainer. And the tire pressure, normally that would be written on the side of the tire, and that's probably the best place to start. And if you're unable to see that, I'd probably suggest somewhere between 80 to 90 PSI. That would be a good starting point to use. Um, so that should, should get you set up nicely. It's important as well to remember that if you've got a turbo trainer that can read out power or display power, then you should always use the same tire pressure as normal, as make that consistent. And it's important to calibrate that correctly as well. Sort of wheel on turbo trainers that have a power measurement are really, really sensitive to changes in tire pressure and make sure you calibrate it before each use. Next up, we've got Will Eubank. And he has asked, what is the downside of using an 1134 cassette over an 1128 cassette? So the first difference between those cassettes is obviously the range of the gears. The 1134, a much greater range of gears compared to the 1128. And that is also going to be one of the biggest differences because you've got that large range of gears, the jumps between the gears, obviously if you're using 10 or 11 speed system, depends what you're using, the jumps between them are going to be significantly different. Now the wide range is going to mean that the jumps between each gear is going to be larger than on a cassette with a smaller range of gears. So for example, you might find that if you're riding along on a flat section of road at a consistent speed, you might find that one gear is a little bit too hard and yet when you change down you still find it's actually a little bit too easy so you sort of haven't really got that middle ground of gears whereas on a cassette with a smaller range of gears you've probably got closer ratios between each gear and that will enable you to use or just find a gear that you find is a bit more comfortable and better for what the speed you're riding at um, next up we've got simon and he says hello gcn team um, i've got two questions first why don't road bikes use V-brakes? Um, they're more powerful than usual rim brakes on road bikes, he says, down to physics. And secondly, if he wanted to mount V-brakes onto his gravel bike, is that possible, and if so, how? Um, so yeah, quite a lot of, sort of in-depth questions in there. And first off, let's answer why road bikes don't have V-brakes on them. And one of the, main, one of the main points is Road bikes just quite simply don't have the same mounting points that V-brakes require. Um, V-brakes tend to have come from mountain bikes. They're designed for wider rims, wider tires. Road bikes, obviously the complete opposite of that. So they're just quite simply not designed for it. They won't actually fit. So you've not really got much choice there. New, new style rim brake calipers are actually pretty efficient too. And to be honest, I'd probably say just as good as any V-brake system out there, especially the latest dual pivot mounts, they're, uh, or dual pivot brakes, they're probably the best and most recent addition to Shimano's lineup at least, and they offer fantastic stopping power. So moving on to his next part of his question, which he's put, is it possible for him to mount V-brakes onto his gravel bike? Well, unfortunately the answer for that, I'm gonna say is probably not. Most gravel bikes, especially more recent ones, tend to be disc brake specific only. And out on gravel, I think you're probably gonna be best off sticking to disc brakes. Now there are probably a few unique or specialist frame manufacturers out there that will make a gravel specific bike that could have V-brake bosses on it. Although I think you're probably gonna be searching for quite a while to find that. So my advice, stick with traditional rim brake calipers on the road and switch across to disc brakes for your gravel bike. I hope that clears it up for you. So next in, we've got Lee Harwood. Says again, hi Ollie. Sorry again, it's still me. Um, and he is asking, if you could use different size crank arms to address leg length discrepancy, um, is, this the thing, is this something that's done? And if it is, or if it's not, why not? Um, so 
I can kind of see the method of thinking here. If you've got a leg length discrepancy, why can't you just use a shorter crank or longer crank, whichever side it is? Um, and it was a question I was almost a little bit of un unsure of myself. So I've asked a good friend of mine um, who is actually a bike fitter himself, runs his own company doing bike fits. And the answer to that is quite simply, no. Using a different length crank from one side to the other is something that they certainly don't advise on. Um, and there's a very in-depth answer behind it, which to be honest, a lot of it did go over my head. But the simple answer is no. It's best advised not to do that. I think it's down to a combination of changing the length of the crank, actually change the diameter of the circle that you're gonna pedal in, and leg length discrepancy issues tend to be best addressed with a cleat stack or shim to adjust that. So I think going with that, if you've got a leg length discrepancy, it's worth getting it checked, seeking sort of professional advice from a bike fitter about that, and probably stick into a cleat wedge. Our next question is in from Diego Dor Bates. They say, hi GCN, I'm a fairly new cyclist trying to get into racing, and a quick Google search has shown that my FTP is still somewhat low but my FTP per kilogram is high because I'm quite light. In Zwift, this is great, but which is a more accurate measurement when outdoor cycling? Um, so, obviously, yeah, thanks for getting in touch with that. Glad that you're uh, getting, into, getting into racing, especially Zwift with the weather changing. Um, so as you say, on Zwift, obviously, watts per kilo, which is your power to weight, is obviously the king. Um, Zwift uses all, all sorts of algorithms that heavily rely on watts per kilo to move your avatar either quicker or slower depending on uh, the output of power that you've got per your kilograms or mass of body weight. Um, however, out on the road, that is not always going to be the case. Out on the road, watts per kilo tends to only be really crucial when going up steep inclines, for example, or any gradients. Outside or when you're not going uphill, it tends to be your absolute power or the actual amount of watts that you're outputting, which is the most important thing. So that combined with not only that, your aerodynamic drag, they're gonna be the two crucial parts that are gonna dictate how fast you're riding when out on the road. So as a light rider, you're obviously gonna have good watts per kilo, so that's gonna help you out on the climbs, but it's worth investing a bit of effort into seeing if you can improve your aerodynamic position on the bike and just your all round physical strength. So keep at it, work hard, and that'll help you out both when Zwift and out on the road too. And next up, we have got a question from James Dillerman. He says, as someone who took up cycling this summer, if he moves his bike indoors for the winter and rides on his kicker snap, what routine bike maintenance would he look to do? Um, and he's assuming that he doesn't have to wash his bike, but what should he watch out for? Well, riding indoors is obviously a great idea over winter, if like me, you just hate riding in the cold and wet. It is a lot easier to head indoors, hook your bike up to Zwift or your turbo trainer and just keep warm, maybe not dry because you're gonna be very sweaty. But some important maintenance tasks that you're not gonna auto automatically have thought of, mostly are gonna arise from sweat and germs on your bike. Now, your bike's obviously not gonna get filthy dirty with grit and road grime, so items such as your chain, bearings and parts like that are gonna stay pretty clean and well maintained. But it's important to, to cover those aspects of sweat and germs on the bike. You could look to make sure you wash it every couple of weeks just to save any sweat damaging the paint or seeking into the headset bearings because it could risk damaging those too. And another area which I've always highlighted is it's important to keep your handlebars clean. Now on the turbo, you're always sweating, wiping your nose, your face, touching the handlebars and it's just, it's just not great. The handlebar tape soaks it all up, gets all covered in germs, grime and sweat. And it's just worth taking a bike outside every week or two, give it a good scrub, scrub the handlebar tape especially, um, and keep it all germ-free, clean and working correctly. Um, you could probably also look to use dry chain lube as well. Not really much use using the wet weather chain lubes that you would use in the winter otherwise. So a few basic points there, that should sort you out. And in with our last question for today's tech clinic, Ryan Hashem Jamie has asked, do you think we can see road bike and mountain bike exchanging technologies? Like road bikes getting disc brakes, for example, and also through axles. Mountain bikes have been getting internal cable routing. Um, so will road bikes get a separate brake lever and shifters like modern mountain bikes in the future? Do I think that's a possibility? He says he thinks it will make upgrades and customization a lot easier. Well, it's a good question and actually, is a topic that Ollie and I have got lined up for a tech show in the coming weeks. So you've obviously picked on that the same as we have. Now, 
Obviously, there are lots of areas of tech that both mountain bikes and road bikes share and have crossed over with one another, but I don't think separate brake levers and shifters are going to be working their way onto road bikes anytime soon. Now, we have seen more recently group sets such as the Shimano GRX using the separate brake top levers that are on the tops of the bars, and that's very similar to what older sort of cyclocross riders might, might have used on their bikes. But I can't see separate brake and shift levers coming into use on the road. I think that's something that we might see on gravel bikes with a separate brake lever, but unfortunately, I think it's a no from me on the road. So that draws this week's tech clinic to a close. I hope you found those answers helpful, and if you've got any more questions, as always, submit them in the comments using hashtag AskGZNTech. And next week, I hope to pick out some good ones and give you the answers to those too. So I guess I'll see you there. Thanks very much.